Hello and welcome to Curator with a Camera. I'm Anthony Cools, Senior Curator at the National Railway Museum and today we're at Locomotion in Shildon to look at the Hunslet Austerity Locomotive Juno. With the outbreak of World War II, the War Department, or the Ministry of Supply, had a requirement for steam locomotives to shunt their depots, their supply depots for ordnance, for tanks, for equipment and all sorts of things. And they chose the London Midland and Scottish Railway Ginty, the 3F tank locomotive. However, they were persuaded that this locomotive wasn't really suitable and that they would be better developing a locomotive designed for those specific needs. And the result of that was what is now known as the Hunslet Austerity Saddle Tank. It's so-called austerity because it was made during austerity measures, so the idea was to build it cheaply, to build it simply, and to build as many as were practically possible. The first of them rolled off the production line at Hunslet in Leeds in 1943, and they had a design life of only two years. They were meant to pull a thousand tonnes on a level track and basically were regarded as consumable pieces of kit. These engines were used in the UK at military destinations, at military depots, supply bases, and also after D-Day, a number crossed the English Channel and were used on the continent, certainly in France, the Netherlands, Belgium, even Tunisia, North Africa. These engines were seen all over in the theatre of war and what happened thereafter. And by the end of the war, well over 370 had been made. Now, the design was so versatile that the Ministry of Supply, the War Department, actually asked for more and they had another 12 austerities constructed for them uh, during the 1950s. And Juno here is one of the final batch of four that were made. So why were they so long lived when they should have only had a design life of two years? Let's have a look at what makes an austerity tick. Looking at it from a distance, there's a lot of engine in a small space. It is the classic steam tank engine and some might say it's the ultimate steam tank engine it's a saddle tank locomotive the saddle tank here which extends over the top of the boiler and the smoke box carries water but most importantly for our point of view allows us to access in between the frames to the slide bars the connecting rods and the crank axle you'll see that it's all welded construction, dead easy, no rivets to get in the way. And it's an inside cylinder locomotive. So there are no cylinders on the outside. The wheels are coupled together with a coupling rod, but the connecting rods from the cylinders to the crank axle are there in between the frames. So twofold, you can get at it, you can access the motion to oil it and maintain it from this running board, from the running plate, without a side tank getting in the way. But also, if you're operating on rough track, then there's nothing on the outside in the form of, of valve gear and motion to get caught, stuck, clouted, or damaged by anything that's obstructing the rails. And Juno itself was built in 1958 for Stuarts and Lloyds. Uh, Stuarts and Lloyds were an East Midlands steel company making tubes and they had an iron ore mining branch that worked across uh, Lincolnshire into Rutland and across the Midlands. Now working in an ironstone quarry there's a lot of dust around so you don't really want that getting into the working part so we don't want to have lots of dust going between the wheel tyres and the brake blocks because it'll do two things, it'll wear away, it becomes a grinding paste and therefore it will wear away the tyre and it will wear away the brake block much faster than is otherwise anticipated. So this engine, very unusually for an industrial saddle tank locomotive, has wheel washers. So there's a pipe 
comes out of the bottom of the saddle tank there, actuated by that lever from the cab and the pipe runs along the foot plate and disappears through a hole. Where does it go? Comes out just there underneath the loco onto the tire and you can see there's, there's, there's the pipe and what that purely and simply does is dribble water down onto the tire and cleans any dust and muck away from the engine so that it's not wearing down the tires and it's able to, uh, to keep the wheels clear. Now here's a little feature on the side of the engine that I really rather like. This locomotive uh, began life for Stuarts and Lloyds and it worked for them for 10 years. So it didn't really do very much. In terms of museum originality, this is about as good as it gets apart from the paint. Nothing on this engine has been replaced during its preservation history. Uh, it's on loan to us from the Isle of Wight Steam Railway who fully recognise that original nature of this engine. When it came to us, we asked the Isle of Wight's permission to, to begin to clean it up and we found underneath uh, this very strange Kermit green here, we found the original lettering, Stuarts and Lloyds Minerals Limited, and that's the locomotive's plant number 1654 stroke 247. It's not really very useful if you're a train spotter trying to take its number, but if you're in the offices at Stuarts and Lloyds and this thing needs a spare part, that's its reference number. So we were able to keep this and stabilize it. We've protected it with a layer of varnish over the top of it. We really rather hoped we could take the whole locomotive back to this original Stuarts and Lloyds green uh, using uh, modern techniques of conservation. Unfortunately, the rest of the paint wasn't in as good order as this. Um, so the team here at Locomotion gave the locomotive uh, a matched coat of Stuarts and Lloyds green. So all of this is repainted green apart from this patch here. And this says to me, this is this engine's working life, it's working history. But uh, what else on the Hunza austerity on the outside? Well, in industry, it is a piece of kit, it's a tool, and you want your crews who are operating it to have the life as easy as possible. So you can see here that uh, Stuarts and Lloyds actually put a new, an extra rung on the bottom of the cab steps so that you weren't having to step up quite so far as you would with the standard design uh, of the Hunslet Austerity, which only started here. So you only had two steps on the production engine originally. Stuarts and Lloyd added the third rung, and you'll also see they've put anti-slip material to help the drivers as well, because if you've got your boot on a steel step, you might stand the risk of, of losing grip. Moving to the back of the engine, we've seen on a lot of our steam locomotives that they have works plates telling you about where they were made and who made them and when. And Juno is no exception. So here is its works plate on the, on the bunker, on the coal bunker. Hunslet Engine Company Limited, number 3850 of 1958. Now 3850 doesn't mean that they made 3,850 of these engines in 1958. It's the sequence number and that is the year that they were made. So let's go and have a look in the cab and see some more of those original Hunslet features. the engine is pretty much as it came out of service. It did a few years working at the Buckinghamshire Railway Centre at Quainton Road, but in essence it is as it left industry. It hasn't had 40 years of modifications and repairs. So you can see it's slightly got that slightly lived in look. I think they call it a patina, don't they, in the, uh, in, in the antique business. But it is rather lovely because it gives us a snapshot of what a steam locomotive in daily service would have been like. Yes, there might have been a bit more polish on some of the handles and a bit of bright work, but in terms of the fact that this is not cleaned up, uh, this is pretty much as it would have been. So what have we got in the cab? Well, there is the lever reverser uh, for, the, for the loco for forward and reverse. Um, if you've seen some of the curator with the cameras, you'll see some of the, sometimes there are engines that have a screw reverse, but this is a standard, simple shunting engine. So let's grab hold of the lever, lift the catch, and push it forward to go forwards, and backwards to go backwards. And that sets the valves in between the frames in the direction of travel. 
Other controls on the boiler back head include the steam valve for the injectors. The injectors themselves are mounted underneath the cab, but these are the clack valves which help uh, the delivery of, of, the, of water into the boiler as well as the steam coming out to control those injectors. So they are the method of getting the boiler water fed from the saddle tank over the top of the loco boiler into the boiler itself against steam pressure. That is duplicated on the other side. It's always good to have two methods of getting water into the boiler because if one fails, then you've got a fail slave and you're never going to get yourself into trouble. Uh, the most important feature on the back head is perhaps the, uh, the water gauge glass itself. And uh, on a working engine, you would be able to see the level of water in that glass tube. And then on the floor, uh, two dampers, which allow air in through the bottom of the firebox and again, that's about aiding combustion, getting the fire to burn more efficiently and effectively, or also quietening the engine down by shutting the damper and calming the fire down. Sometimes people call those the steam switch if they're having a bit of a giggle, but uh, very, very useful parts of the engine. Of course, one part that we haven't talked about, where is the whistle? And on this engine, it's not really a case of any, uh, any fancy cord or chain or lever. It is quite simply this bit of forged and well welded bar and that simple as that you're driving along the track in the quarry and you, and you want to blow the whistle just push that up and it just makes a noise because it's not but a piece of kit as some people would say and our final pieces on the foot plate of equipment are the handbrake with the handbrake stanchion going down there and then across the back of the cab fire irons and uh, usually three of them a poker for poke, raking the fire through uh, along the fire bars, a clinker poker or a dart for breaking up bits of clinker across the fire bed and the fire grate, and then an ash rake for raking ash from underneath and the ash pan. So really helpful bits and pieces. Uh, rear windows that are also hinged and operate so you can get ventilation through and a cab rear hatch which opens up and enables you to get through into the coal space and also a lamp bracket there if you needed to take the lamp in or out. So a very simple machine built in difficult and constrained times, designed to operate only for two years and then be thrown away like any other piece of plant. In reality, some of these engines lasted for over 40 years, a design life exceeded by a magnificent percentage. The Hunsler Austerity, therefore, is a great example of how the steam locomotive has endured. Engines of this type were in operation right until the mid to late 1980s. On private sidings in collieries, the Austerity was still doing the job it was built for. Absolutely amazing. Thank you for joining us for Curator with a Camera today, looking at the Hunslet Austerity locomotive. If you've enjoyed today's film, why not like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes of Curator with a Camera.